I have a question. Uh, Ma'am, please have the name of the Pond Cove school nurse. Okay. Um, I would recommend that we make a change on page 8C from Paul to Paula. Just a typo. Hi, I'm Matt Wright and I'm the SAC representative here. Um, I'm also here today kind of without a voice, so you're going to have to <laughs> bear with me. Um, having passed through the first month or so of the school year and we're all kind of settling into the academic life, academic school routine, as far as the SAC is, is uh, concerned, we recently had our annual retreat sort of get things moving um, on the 22nd of September. The three subcommittees, Spirit, Project, and Policy, met and I'm going to discuss some of the ideas presented there, which were kind of the core, what was discussed then. Um, the Spirit subcommittee discussed several projects to promote a sense of community in the school, among them the possibility of an all-school field day um, and a joke contest or something. We thought the competition between classes might promote some class spirit. The policy committee was chiefly occupied with a review of the SAC constitution um, to deal with situations like uh, vacancy when an officer leaves um, and other procedural concerns which have come up. Um, this committee also began drafting a survey on SAC effectiveness to be distributed later in the year. Finally, the project committee started work on the Senior Service May projects. And you can expect a presentation on that, I guess, in November. Um, there was also some talk about high school involvement with the community, especially with senior citizens. Um, also at our last SAC meeting on Thursday, we discussed a fundraiser for a local charity. And you'll get more information on that next time. That's about it. Okay, next month. <laughs> okay, the next item on the agenda is communications. You. Uh, are the uh, mics on? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think all the mics are on now. <laughs> Hopefully. I have one communication which I intended to share last month and um, got at the bottom of the pile, unfortunately, and didn't. Ah, here we have the middle school oh. rep. <laughs> Very good. Let's back up okay. our staff. Come on up. Come on. This is known as just in time. <laughs> Good evening. 
My name is Stacy Pickering and I'm Nina Hanexon. We are the school board representatives for the middle school this year. We would like to briefly tell you uh, what we have been discussing at our past meetings. Our major topics are the 7th and 8th grade dances and the 5th and 6th grade socials. Currently we have been um, focusing on a new disc jockey for this year's dance, first dance. And um, our members have come up with a variety of choices for them. We have also discussed with Mrs. Hutton the alternative of having the scoreboard lights off and um, parent chaperones dismissed for the first dance. Um, we feel that we the students should have an opportunity to show the school that we are more mature and really should have a chance to to try it out and see if we can make it this year. Um, we'd like to, if we can make this privilege happen, then we'll have it for the rest of these dances. Um, however, we'll have several t teacher chaperones for the dance, and um, we understand the consequences that we'll suffer if we fail to, if we abuse this privilege. So, um, and that's basically our main topic. We plan hope to discuss more about the sixth and fifth and sixth grade socials very soon. So, are there any questions? Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. The um, <clears throat> going back to communications. I had a letter from the uh, gentleman who is the 1993 Maine Teacher of the Year, Richard Kent, explaining that as part of his Maine Teacher of the Year duties, he has uh, been invited to participate in a Goals 2000 Teacher Forum on November 18th and 19th in conjunction with American Education Week. What is interesting is that he was told he could bring, uh, he had been asked to choose a second outstanding teacher as a partner at this forum. And he says, I'm happy to tell you that I've selected Miss Mary Hart, Master of Fine Arts, art education teacher at Cape Elizabeth High School as my associate. Um, he has worked in a, uh, Mary worked with him as a colleague a few years back and certainly those of us who have seen any of her work and the work that she uh, elicits from students understands why he would choose her. Um, so I wanted to call to your attention that one of our staff will be going on that trip and hopefully we'll get some feedback. That's my communication. Any other communications? Okay. Oh, Charlie? Can you just explain this main association of school oh, nurses yes. communication? Yes, that's right. I'm sorry. I'm really I, I do remember putting that in. I was thinking I was putting it as a policy issue rather than simply a communication, but you're right, it is under that piece. Um, I received this from the Maine Association of School Nurses as their attempt to define school nursing. And since in our policy review uh, meetings, we are beginning to tackle that problem. We haven't actually brought forward a policy to the full board yet. Uh, we have had some discussion of it um, in general terms, and I see it as an issue where we really need to, um, to clarify what expectations the community has for nursing, uh, and also between the nursing staff and the regular staff, secretarial staff as well as teachers, uh, we often find that there are gray lines. People are not exactly sure who is supposed to be doing what. It seemed to me that this effort, uh, which I think it's um, fair to say is an offshoot of some of the policy dilemmas that schools are now getting into, particularly with, uh, I think the term is me medically fragile or technology dependent uh, students. Um, those are, are phrases I'm sure that, that are really confusing if you're not dealing with them. But we, for instance, that issue that occurred in, um, was it Lewiston? Lewiston. The Lewiston board and uh, about a student being in school with, with particularly delicate needs and school board all of a sudden or school personnel being faced with a dilemma that they had not. It is not covered in this communique, but I thought that you would like it as background material. Please put it in your policy folder and we will be referring to it as we go along. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, the next item is superintendent's report. I'm going to go to the superintendent. Um, we'll try to just briefly summarize a couple of things here, and then we have people here from both the high school and the middle school to actually report on testing, which I highlight tonight. 
we are continuing to have total quality um, and system-wide meetings of one kind or another. Uh, in fact, today, uh, the group all morning, uh, the group that met was uh, having difficulty necessarily calling ourselves something, but what, they are, what we are is a group of the supervisors of support services, including the business manager, Sue Weatherby, community services director, also uh, helps uh, direct some of our uh, maintenance, custodial, and transportation functions. We have a transportation supervisor, maintenance supervisor, uh, myself, Mary Bruns, who has been uh, working from a staff development point of view on this effort. Um, right now, we're getting close to finding a real timeline. We will be, we will be, <laughs> commitment, uh, publishing a handbook uh, that will set out quality standards for the support services that will be a reference so that everybody in the system, as well as uh, parents or community members who have some interest in these issues, We'll have a sort of a yellow book, yellow pages of support services, who do you call, under what circumstances. Um, as we work on this project and use some of the total quality tools to clarify and focus our thinking, I think we're all learning something about uh, the value of the process, but also I'm looking forward to having that in people's hands because we've been very unclear about who's in charge of what. Um, it's a an issue when we get down to building committee, I'm asked repeatedly in, my, in the discussions I have with people about the building referendum, how are we going to assure the community that if we have renovated buildings that we will take care of them? And I would see the effort of this group as being really critical. And once we have finished our work and published the handbook, being very visible, the concrete piece that we can show people. Um, so I'm excited about the project. I think that it is moving along. In addition, we had some, uh, one uh, meeting with a teacher group today. We also had uh, some individual consulting with administrators, and that process will be continuing. Any questions? I, I think that's a great step to take. Oh, to publish that handbook. You think that'll be this year? Oh, yeah. we have committed ours. What was the date? January? No, wait a minute. Maybe it was March. I think it started out being January and it kind it of slid March. over to March. Well, March, March. March. Yeah. March is good. Well, I will have a draft by January. That was what it was. So you'll see it when it gets in the Final in March. Great. Just one comment. Is the teacher group that met today, is this more of a informational learning process or are they working on some kind of project? It's a step towards moving, uh, it is moving from the awareness to a, um, an actual problem solution or problem definition. Um, one of the things that is, has occurred and is very evident working with teaching staff, their plate is kind of over full as it is. And we have been trying to find ways to incorporate working on specific problems, problems that they would be working on anyway in one way or the other, and also trying to work at a time that fits their regular planning time and then to come up with fairly simple cost-effective ways of extending that. Um, I'll bring you some, certainly by next month I'll have a list of those and can show you how we intend to do that. Okay, the next item is fourth and eighth grade scores and their differences. It's Lyle, going to Lyle is here. Out. You had in your packet a summary. This is a follow-up to some of your questions about the fourth grade MEA scores, um, both in the way in which the eighth grade, um, does it stay consistent or not? What are the changes? And then also I think the really um, rather critical and interesting issue that surfaced with a gender gap not so much now in the math and science as far as um, girls is concerned, we're seeing and noting some of the gender gaps that involve boys in the beginning reading and writing stages. So that's what some of this information was focused on. Good evening. Would you like me to summarize this or do you want to go right into questions? I'd appreciate a summary. Okay. Um, first of all, if you recall last summer early, I had presented a, uh, an outline of the uh, grade eight scores, and you folks had asked how our grade eight students compared to how they did when they were students in the fourth grade. And for your review at the bottom of the front page of my mem memorandum is a review of those 
comparisons that you have already seen. And because the population, both at the Cape Elizabeth schools and at the state, because the st students move in and out a great deal, both in and out of the state and into the school system and out of our school system, we are not supposed to make the kind of comparison that you see there at the bottom of the page. What they suggest instead is picking a cutoff point as to what is a gain, what's a loss, and what would you expect to be a score that's approximately the same from the fourth grade to the eighth grade. So what I did, you can see in the following pages of that report, I listed each one of the students that were here in both grade four and grade eight. And that happened to be 99 students, which is 76% of our current, or, or what was 76% uh, uh, of the current freshman class, uh, eighth graders when I reported last summer. And if you add up all of the pluses, you'll notice that there were 119 gains as defined as a gain. 63 stayed within the five point range. And there were 114 who made less, whose scores actually declined uh, by five points or more. When you work with percentile scores, if the scores stay the same, that is what you would expect to be a year's growth for a particular student. Or if you were looking at a class of students, that would be the expected growth. Our students score high in the uh, comparison for the state. And four years later, they were actually scoring a little bit higher than they were when they were fourth grade students. And as you can see, um, we had five more gains than, than losses. Is that uh, clear? Yep. Okay. The I guess next I, I, I'm not sure I know what it means, though, in terms of is this typical for classes we've seen in the past, that it would be pretty much um, from fourth to eighth grade, we see a little bit of a gain, but pretty much even, or is this anything striking? That's very typical. I've done this once or twice before, and the results were just about the same. One of the things that I would point out is um, it's the differences are fairly minor, but there was quite a few more gains in the area of math than there were in reading. And reading and writing were approximately the same. When you're dealing with 99 students and you get differences um, that are that small, it's hard to determine if they're if the gains or losses are that significant. But you can be assured that because they did come out higher, we are certainly keeping pace with the high level of achievement uh, compared to the state. Were, were you gonna say anything about the gender oh, yes. gap issue? Okay, again, <clears throat> going to page three, in the middle of the page, that's a chat for your review that elicited the question, um, are the boys' scores lower because there's a significant larger number of boys in special education than girls? And I did a lot of work here that doesn't show up here like it does on the first comparison. But uh, the bottom of the page there, there is a summary of explain that to you folks for a little clarification and for the people who may be watching on TV. Um, the, in the area of special services, the average score on a percentile basis in reading uh, for boys was 35, for girls 21, compared to the regular class where the average score was 68.5 for the boys and 79 for the girls in the regular classroom. Uh, in math, the uh, boys in special services scored the 72nd percentile, the girls the 24th percentile. In the regular class, 
the uh, boys scored at the 74.6 percentile, and the girls scored at the 80th percentile. In writing, the uh, special services students scored for the boys the 40th percentile, for the girls 63rd percentile, and then for the regular class students, uh, the writing uh, score for the boys average was 60.1 while the girls in the regular classroom scored at 81.6%. So there are two or three trends that you can certainly pick up there. Uh, one is that uh, because there is a significant number of boys in special education and their average is 35.8, that will certainly bring the reading score down. The same thing is true in writing. When you look at a comparison of 40 versus 63.3. But yet, it's also obvious that that's not the whole story because if you factor out any special education students, you will see that in reading, the girls outscore the boys by approximately 10 points in reading by about five points in math, and by in excess of 20 percentile points in uh, writing. And 20 percentile points is a very significant uh, difference. And that's comparing non-special services student to non-special services student grouped uh, by gender. Another interesting thing that came out is kind of a, a side uh, factor. And you certainly can't read anything into this being a one-year comparison. But this is something that I would suggest that we continue to look at. You'll notice that the, in reading, the boys' reading score was about 15 points higher than the girls, which raises the question of are perhaps boys identified a little bit more than girls? And I would suggest that that is an area that we might uh, continue to follow. Um, the same thing is true if you look at the writing. And if you look at the math, you'll notice that the boys scored in the 72nd percentile in math while the girls scored the 24th. So there are some kind of subgrouping of gender issues here as well, I suspect. Or if the trends continue like that, and I say, please don't draw any conclusions from those very preliminary figures based on a very small number of students. But uh, if that's a continuing trend, it's certainly something that we should look at. Any questions or comments while we have the strobe lights here? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Lyle, can you tell me as a group um, how the um, students who weren't here in the fourth grade did? I know, that's, that's really pulling the fast one, I'm I sorry. I can get it, but I don't have it right now, no I don't. Okay. You don't have a sense of if they were in the high end, the low end, or if well, they were it, right in the middle? Well, it varies a lot because um, when we get our when we get our report back from the state, and you should have information like this on file from prior reports, um, in the last page summary, it asks the students in the subgrouping of how many students moved here in kindergarten, how many people moved here in third grade, how many people moved here in fourth grade. And then they pull out those students' scores as a grouping. So those would be the students who came into the school system at different in intervals. And those scores are all over the place. Okay. Again, it's because of the very small number of students. What happens with this report after we read it? Where does it go? Depends on what the board and the administration decides to do with it. Well, certainly, I understand it has not yet been shared with teachers, right? That's correct. So clearly, one of the first things that needs to happen is that the teachers of particularly this year's fifth grade, I would guess, 
um, need to look at this and um, probe for what their observations are with youngsters in the class, what kind of uh, light can they shed on the testing scores per se, and I think we should uh, pick it up from there. Nancy and I have already talked about it, and we are setting up meetings with each of the grade levels, not just grade eight, not just grade seven. But we will be meeting with grades five through eight, and, and, and we're already talking about meeting with elementary school teachers starting in grade one. So uh, we will sit down with each grade level of teachers to share both the results of these, the results of the tests that I'm going to talk about next, as well as the results of the uh, MEA tests, and to share with them the format and to help all students, I mean all teachers throughout the system, to understand the kind of tests the kids take when they get into grades 4, 8, and 11. Charlie? So the, the gender gap in writing, is that about where it's been or is it worse? Did I miss something? I think that's more significant than it has been in the past. I'm fairly certain it is. And the reading about the same? The reading runs about like that. Okay. I don't remember seeing that. Maybe bigger. not quite as much, but it's for always it's been it has been pretty significant. Mm. One of the things that happens I think is People tend to talk about, and the media presents both TV and newspaper. They always talk about the math and science and girls trailing behind. But here, clearly, the, the boys trail in language arts more than the girls do in math, math and science, for sure. Other comments? Hi, John. Did, did we get a copy of the fourth grade MEA? Mm -hmm. We do. Last month. Last month. Okay. I have to go back to that. Actually, I think it was last spring that the fourth grade, you had 11th grade last month, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I, I would, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're planning to share these with the administrators and the teachers, and I would hope that you would keep, keep us, both you and the administrators, up to date on what's done with this, because I do, I do think some of these um, trends are are troubling and correctable. They and definitely correctable, and it's. I'm sure the teachers will have some good ideas on how to correct it once they know what the data is. So, I appreciate doing all the work. It was a lot of work, and it's it's very helpful. Thank you. On the uh, last page, uh, chat two <coughs> presents the uh, median national percentile scores for all the students who took the spring test achievement testing. Uh, those initials stand for the uh, Comprehensive Test of Basic Skills, the fourth edition. And uh, you can see that scores are listed for grades three, five, six, seven, and eight. Those are the grade levels that do not take the MEA test scores. We do not believe in giving two major tests in one year. This is why uh, you will see either the MEA scores or the CTBS scores presented. Um, the subtests vary a little bit between the third grade and the middle school. And uh, the uh, tests are there for you to view. One thing that I would point out is that when we were doing the SRAs, you were presented a national student average percentile score. This particular test uses a median percentile, national percentile score. Uh, the mean was simply the average. The uh, median percentile score is actually the middle score between the high and the low. But in our school? In our school, that's correct. Based on a national comparison. Did the uh, mean uh, mean anything, or was it available? The, the mean was not available, number one. And number two, theoretically, the scores would be about the same. Theoretically, they'd be exactly the same. Yeah, but often they're not. 
That's correct. That's why I say they'd be, they'd be close. Right. In any event, it's, insig it's not significant for these purposes. Right. I just pointed out so that right. if you see mean and in the old report and see me uh, see median here, you won't think that it's a misprint. It's, it's a minor difference there. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Lyle. Thank you. Okay, the next item is annual high school testing programs. And this is Sharon Merrill is We have a lot of reports to go through this evening, so um, let's let's get started. Um, generally speaking, the reports are very good, so um, I don't think it will take us as long as it as it looks like it might. Looking at the size of the of the packet that you got, I thought we would start with the CTP three. Um, this is the ninth and tenth grade testing program. Um, we'll start with those grades, and then we'll progress um, through the the grades um, and through the 12th grade, which is the, the AP exams. Uh, this is our second year with CTP. Um, last year, we did it as a pilot project with the company. In fact, they donated the test materials. Um, it was the last year of, the, of their previous edition of the exam. Um, it was a helpful base of information for us. This year, we're with the CTP-3, which is their exam for the, um, the 1990s. Um, it's updated for um, current math, programming, and so on. Um, the score reports are a little bit different, and um, Mr. Defusco is here with me, and we put one up on the overhead, so um, I'd like to go through one with you. The company that produces this test, Educational Records Bureau, is the secondary division of the College Board uh, test company, ETS. It's written for uh, suburban schools, um, and, and by far the largest constituent of this exam is, is uh, private and independent schools. And I thought it would just be helpful to you to know about the suburban schools that are, that are using that exam, uh, because they're our norm peer group. Um, there are no public schools in Maine that are using this exam. Uh, in Massachusetts, uh, the public schools using this exam are Belmont Public Schools, Dover Sherbourne, Duxbury, Holliston, Hamilton Wenham, uh, Wellesley, Weston, Sharon High School, and so on. So in other words, they're, they're true um, suburban type high schools like ourselves. And I explain that because I, I really want to focus you on the suburban score. You can see that there is a national norm, there is an independent school norm. But the real score that we should focus on as a school is the suburban score. Um, it's reported a little bit differently than we're used to seeing um, tests of this sort in the past, uh, in that it's reported in a bell curve, and I think it's very helpful. That's going to be our score norm there. What would help you to understand the scores quickly and easily is if you look at the bottom. At the bottom, uh, there's a norm percentage. And the norm percentage means uh, that's the number in a suburban school that's expected to be in certain score bands. Then the local percentage, that's where we are, or where we should, uh, no, where we are. Uh, the score above is, is where we should be. So if we look across the bottom of the bell curves here in the suburban group, uh, we'll see that uh, in a suburban high school like ours, uh, verbal ability, 23% uh, of the students uh, score below average, 56, excuse me, 54% average, 23% above average. 
So if you look down at local percentage, you can see very quickly how our students did in grade nine. Uh, with a little blips above and below the bell curve there, you can see that they're, they're pretty much on target uh, for suburban high school youngsters. So using that suburban chart, um, let's just walk through this score report and, and see how our students did. Okay, that is verbal ability. On the next page, vocabulary, and I'm not going to put each one up on the screen here, I just wanted to do that one as an example. So on the next page, suburban, for vocabulary, you can see that our students scored um, actually better uh, than expected uh, in vocabulary in, in suburban norms. Uh, more in the average range, above range where they should be, and uh, less below average than should be. Okay, um, let's move into the next one, which is reading comprehension. And looking at the bell curve, we can see that our students are scoring, uh, again, in the average to above average, a little bit better than we're, we're um, expected as a suburban school to do. Looking at writing mechanics on the next page. Um, here, uh, we're, uh, we have a 5% more in the below average range than is predicted for suburban school. Um, average is, is right on target. So this is the first one where we have a, a few out of the bell curve a little bit. On the next page, writing process, um, pretty much right on target predicted for suburban schools. Uh, quantitative ability. Uh, again, uh, the students are pretty much on target um, for suburban schools in quantitative ability. Mathematics, um, again, we're not seeing any, um, any great deviations here, uh, perhaps more in the average range than above average that is predicted for suburban schools. Okay, the last two uh, tests for the ninth graders are end of course exams. Uh, these are provided for this company um, for schools to use if, if they want to. We're choosing to use them as end of course exams uh, for algebra, algebra two, and geometry with the ninth grade students. Um, I've, I've included them even though uh, the company has, uh, with the new CTP3, doesn't have a norm group large enough to have accurate norms for this. Um, they like to have 600 students in a, a base to norm a test, and they don't have that yet in the first year of this test. So we can look at them, but they sent us a letter with our score report encouraging us to be very, very careful in using these end of course exams, that they're just not normed and they won't be properly for probably two more years. But it's interesting to look at them, I guess. Uh, and with the Algebra 1 students uh, in the ninth grade, there are 25 students who took this, um, and they happen to have done um, very well, very respectably on this. Algebra 2, uh, these are ninth graders that are already in third year of high school math. There were six of them. Uh, they took this end of course exam. They, they did, I think, very, very well, um, average and above average suburban schools. And geometry is the last one. Um, I think, um, again, even though these are not accurate norms, I, I think the students did pretty well uh, with the geometry test. Okay, I'll stop there and see if there are any questions so far, if this is making sense to everybody what we're doing with this. Okay. Um, Yes. Just back to the mathematics. Since this was taken in March '93, does that cover elements of of algebra, or is this just general mathematics? Does it cover elements of geometry, right. algebra? What we did is we gave the CTP three in the end of March, and then we held out the answer sheets, uh, and the algebra and geometry students took this the second week of June, so they took it at the end of the year. And then we sent the answer sheets in. So the algebra geometry students got to finish the whole year of math. I'm, I'm not, is that what you were asking? Okay. 
does this represent the total class that took the mathematics? Oh, that's what I'm asking. I okay, guess. no. Um, the students who took these, uh, it tells you the number of cases at the top. And uh, the only students who took these, it just so happens, uh, was the students in the honors algebra and geometry classes because they had actually finished the course the second week of June. The college prep students have finished their coursework. They're taking this exam next week. Um, and so we'll be getting their score results later on. Um, they had one more chapter to finish, uh, and so they didn't take the test. So I'll get those later. Okay, this is a more competitive exam than we've been accustomed to, and, um, in, and so is the norm pool that we're being compared to. And we had some concern about that when we started a year ago. Um, given that the uh, SRAs uh, and the other national um, achievement tests provide only national norms and not suburban norms, um, I'll have to say we were, we were very nervous about how we were, we were going to um, to show up on these tests, and uh, in our second year, we're really very pleased with how the students are doing. Um, they're, they're falling pretty much within the predicted uh, bands for suburban schools. Let's go on to the 10th grade. Um, same subtest, uh, starts out with verbal ability, and you can see the predicted norms for suburban schools. Um, no surprises there, um, they, they fell in the bell curve reasonably as they should have. Uh, the same for vocabulary. Uh, in fact, um, they did better uh, than predicted. Reading comprehension. Uh, again, they did better than predicted for suburban schools. Writing mechanics for the 10th graders. Um, here, uh, they're a little bit below uh, what they should be for suburban school. Um, four percentage points below average, more than is predicted for suburban schools, and minus 7% in the above average range. Writing process, pretty much on target there. In fact, better than, than uh, predicted. Quantitative ability. Um, here, uh, it's saying that the quantitative ability for the 10th grade class, mathematics, um, is a little, they're showing up a little more in the average range than is predicted for suburban schools and slightly less in above average. Going on to uh, mathematics, um, the general mathematics skills, it's, it's kind of comparable with what uh, showed up on the uh, math aptitude test. Um, more in the average range and, uh, and fewer in above average than is predicted. Okay, for 10th grade students, now we're getting into the end of course exams. Uh, they took Algebra 2 and Geometry. Um, algebra 2. Um, there's more students in below average than is predicted for 10th graders. Average comes out about right and, um, and no students in the above average range. This was a source of concern for me and I called the um, testing company in Princeton, New Jersey and talked with the um, statistics uh, people. Again, they uh, reminded me of the letter that they sent us. They said uh, there were only 136 students in the norm group uh, for Algebra 2 that they like to have 600. And um, although we should look at these scores and, and um, perhaps find them interesting to us in some way, that the norms just aren't accurate yet for the end of course exams. Um, and they cautioned us to use them um, carefully. And so that was what I got for feedback on that. In fact, they encouraged us to uh, use the end of course exams, but not really uh, use the reports in any way, that we should wait at least one more year, maybe two, until they had really accurate norms. So, Sharon, can I, can I just ask you a question about sure. that? Have the teachers seen these yet? Yes. Mm -hmm. How, how do, do they feel that this reflects their students' achievement, or does it correlate with their coursework or their, their regular tests? 
Uh, Mr. Boothby looked at this. Um, he said that um, the test, the Algebra 2 test, uh, there were no, um, there were t some areas on the test that are not emphasized in our math program, is what he said. There were a couple of areas that, that they're, they're not emphasizing in their Chicago Math Algebra 2. Um, but otherwise, that was the only comment that he had about it. Yeah. I just, when you compare it to the independent, though, we look quite good. Um, so could there be something just, I, I, I guess it jumps out at me that there must have been something weird about the test or material covered in ind independent schools and that we're covering that might be different than what other suburban schools are covering. Excuse me, what did you say about compared to independent schools? Well, if you look at the chart right next to it, mm -hmm. the Algebra 2, we yeah. look pretty good <laughs> compared to the in independent schools. Isn't that right? No, actually, they look better than we do. Oh, this is their gray ranking. Pardon? They have the zero. That's not local, that we have zero below average. The independent schools, uh, their norm chart, they, they have zero below average. Theirs are average and above average. Sorry, so that's not us compared to the independent. There, I guess I'm misreading that graph. I thought our average here, if we look back at the suburban, our local is, we had the zero above average, but those aren't our scores transferred against the independent. Does anybody understand? Um, Am I not <laughs> reading this? Uh -huh. the same problem. <laughs> no, Pardon me? It, it, Am I right in reading it that the suburban score right here, this is our score. That's it's right. showing us, uh -huh. and the independent score is showing independent schools, pri private schools. They're, That's right. They're mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. And the national, they don't have anything. Yeah, I national. guess the zero below average is not our score, where it says local percent. That is not our score, okay. no. Our score is... Uh, only represented in the suburban. in the suburban chart. That's I right. We, that's I right. thought we were compared. The independent that. chart shows you, um, you know, the independent Are norms. Are way above that. How, yeah, that's right. So we're way out of the league if we look. Yeah. At so um, I included it in your packet somewhat hesitantly. I, I I just think that we need to be very careful about using and interpreting this this year. Um, at least that's that's what the. Uh, People at ERB told me that they just simply don't have the numbers and, and don't get excited about this yet. <laughs> yeah. Just one question again about the, uh, the algebra and the geometry, both ninth and 10th. Mm -hmm. These students who took this exam are honors students. That's correct. Okay. Yes. On the next page, geometry in the 10th grade students, there's 23 students who took this. And um, here are their scores. And again, we can feel terrific about this, or we can say, you know, the norms aren't, aren't accurate yet. Um, but this is what we have for beginning information. And, and I think, you know, we'll just um, <coughs> track this for the next um, two years. Okay, um, any other questions about ERB? Sharon, are any of our scores represented on any of the independent blocks, or are those totally not, should we not look at those at all? Uh, let me see. The way that they explain it on the front is it helps you to visualize performance of your, of your group as it compares to national, suburban, and independent populations. Right, but on the, on the sheet that we have here, there seems to be a graph, at least in some of them, where there is some information down below that says local norm, it says independent and then local mm -hmm. on some of them. Yeah. Are we there to read that, that we have been compared in that block with the independent? Yes, that's right. I think that was perhaps what your issue was. Yeah. Okay, perhaps it would be more constructive if I just show you a couple for, for my okay. questions rather than take sure. the time now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that is what that means, that you can compare our scores in the first block compared to the national norms compared to independent school norms. Was that the question that she asked? I think so. Okay. Yeah. 
I'm sorry. Um, I, that is what that means. Um, it compares it to independent school norms. That's right. Okay, it's a little bit uh, a different type of score report. Um, I, th I find it very helpful because it's, for the first time, it's giving us a peer group to compare our students to. And we always felt that we lacked that when we had the, um, the SRA and, and other kinds of uh, uh, national stay nines. So um, generally speaking, I think the students have, have done really very well um, compared to suburban school norms. All right. Um, Sharon, can I just ask a question uh, sure. about how this, well, first of all, I'd like to ask about mechanics, and this really is more like a comment than a question. We have seen consistently, according to what I'm reading, fourth grade, eighth grade, previously the SRAs, now the California tests, now your ninth grade and tenth grade, that mechanics are below average every test, every year. And I guess I just wanted to tie that back to the report we saw from the middle school earlier, and we just really, I need to know on these national tests, do these test scores of um, ability seem to reflect where we think our kids are when they leave our institutions? Do, do we? look at some of our students in the average and below average group when they leave here? Or by the time they leave here, are they all up to above average? I mean, do, do we do anything with these test results which you very uh, expertly try to interpret for us and, and communicate back to the teachers? Is anything done with the material? With these results here? The department heads have them. Um, they've gone over them with their teachers and their departments. Um, they, they do have this information back. Um, the writing uh, mechanics, I went over this with uh, Mrs. Wiley, the English department hand, went over every one of these reports with her. Um, I pointed this out to her, and you'll see it a little bit on the SAT report. Um, we looked at it there, and um, her comment was that um, one of they, they have felt a need, they've seen in their students writing uh, a lack of a good foundation in, in writing mechanics. They've instituted um, a grammar unit in grade nine. They've instituted a um, writing style and expression unit in grade 10 as a way of firming up those skills because they're finding students coming into high school weak in those areas. And, um, and they've noticed that um, they simply need some structured help with that. So they've, they've instituted that in the curriculum. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, would you um, judge by these test results that our students are generally above average? Compared to suburban students? Uh, we are coming out so predictably on target for suburban students. So. I would, what I would say is that um, if we're supposed to be performing like a Wesson, Wellesley, uh, Hamilton, Wenham kind of school, this says we are. And if that's the way that I would answer that, that we're performing like a suburban school should. We never knew that, and so we're finding that out from this. Does that answer your question? That's fine. Okay. Thank you very much. Sharon, can I just make a comment also, just to expand on what Rosemary said? I would really like to say, I mean, that it's, it's great having test results, but you can look at them in a vacuum or, or you can use them for something. And it seems to me, when we do see a trend like this, that we have to take more of a step, and this is not a comment just to you, obviously, but we have to take more of a step than just instituting remedial action at that level, but to try to look back through the system. So I, I would hope that these kinds of results actually on all these tests are shared up and down the line and, and not looked at just as they affect that class right at that moment, but as a way of looking at how did we get to this point and kind of working backwards on mm -hmm. the problem. I mean, mm -hmm. it's great to address the problem once you see it, but obviously it didn't just happen then. And I think we need to do a better job as a system of communicating across uh, the grade lines. Too. I couldn't agree more, and I'm under the impression that that is being addressed in the middle school. I'm not sure. Maybe um, Connie uh, is 
uh, grammar and written expression being addressed system-wide? Well, we certainly have had some conversations, and I know that there are certain uh, steps that people have taken. I wouldn't want to say at this point we have a systematic analysis or program in place. It's sort of at the awareness stage. Um, I would rather finish this particular piece and leave that as something we have to get back to. Any yes. It's, I mean, that issue on mechanics, uh, certain parts of the writing process, certain it aspects of maybe it is a the niceties of grammar are just grasping that there are those niceties um, we certainly see some uh, improvements in those areas where it's been addressed it is a teachable area and it uh, yeah. I, I think like some of the beginning reading issues there are trends that encounter trends and what we're all about right now is getting a stability uh, quotient in there so we can continuously improve we don't want to just ping pong back and forth and and throw out writing process because all of a sudden we're going to concentrate on grammar. We clearly have to have both. And that's mm -hmm. what the conversations have been after. I just wanted to respond to your, your questions. When I go through these reports, and I went through them with Mr. DeFusco, when we see areas of weakness, areas we're concerned about, where we've seen a score drop, we do discuss it. We do talk to the department heads, yes, and what they think is happening. Um, uh, what they think needs to be done about it. So um, we do address them, and, and, and we are concerned when we see those drops happen, and we have done it with these reports. Um, I'll, there's a similar sort of slight quirk with the SAT on written expression, expression, and I'll show that to you when we get to it. Okay, next we have the MEA, and Mr. DeFusco has put uh, the summary chart on the uh, overhead. Again, we were a little nervous about our scores this year. Uh, this class followed uh, the class of 93, which got poor, perfect 400s on everything. They were a fantastic testing class. It was a hard act to follow. Um, and so the class of 94 is up on the uh, screen for us now. And they historically have not been a great testing class, but I really think they did pretty well. Uh, in reading, they got a 400. Writing, they got a 375, and uh, our suburban that comparison uh, score band is it, they construct a suburban range, and so we of course fit the suburban range. And the uh, uh, score range for suburban schools writing is 345 to 390, and and uh, these students got a 375. Mathematics, they got a 390. A science, our score range is 375 to 400. They got a 375 and humanities 385. So uh, overall, I, th I thought they did pretty well. Uh, um, nothing extraordinary in this report. I'll just uh, walk through it kind of quickly. The boys and girls are scoring closer than we've ever seen here in the high school. Um, so we don't have extreme um, uh, gender differences. For example, in the reading results test, uh, the, the 400 score, is there for the whole class, and boys and girls scored evenly in reading uh, in this class, class of 94. Uh, in writing, let me see, uh, the girls scored slightly better than the boy. well, no, actually they scored, that's one of the more dramatic scores in this group. The girls did, they got a 400, and the boys got a 329, so the girls uh, did much better in the writing subtest. Mathematics, uh, the scores are exactly even, 389, 389 for boys and girls, and um, that's great because our girls have been lagging behind, so we were, we we're pleased to see that their math scores are uh, improving. And in science, uh, the girls were uh, lower, 35 points lower than the boys, but we've had times when it's been further apart than that. and. Um, Arts and Humanities, uh, pretty close. Uh, the boys were 389, the girls were 380. Uh, I didn't pick up anything unusual in this, um, this particular test, although I'd be glad for you to ask any questions that you have. Yes? An observation. Under the reading results, the questionnaire item, um, how, is li how is a librarian most helpful in 71% of the test takers in our system answered in teaching how to choose research materials. 
I found that very enlightening in the direction we're going with our library services, the emphasis on research papers from all, both crossing mm -hmm. multi disciplines, and I just I think that's a good testament that we are yeah. making an impression on students, especially yeah. this particular class. Charlie, I would be disappointed if that percentage doesn't continue to increase over the next few years with, with, with our results. But looking at all the questions, that was the one that was the highest response of uh, yes I agree I thought that was wonderful also I loved uh, that what do you choose for reading in your free time and only two percent of our students said that they don't read uh, everybody else I is reading in their free time some magazines fiction nonfiction um, and that was good news because we, we worry about the fact that our kids are not reading as much uh, outside of school but they're all reading something except for two percent any other questions about the MEA. Okay, moving right along. To the um, SAT. There are three score reports in your packet. Um, I'm going to uh, use this high school highlights report. It's really the most helpful, it's the most current, statistically analyzed report from the College Board. I included the other two because they're, uh, they have some other information. They're sort of historical reports we've always gotten from ETS, but the highlight report really um, does the best job. Our chart up on the screen here uh, shows a 10-year, just a 10-year average, which I thought would be helpful to you. Uh, it shows uh, the white diamonds uh, at the top. On the top chart uh, is the Cape Elizabeth High School scores by year and you can see that it goes up and then it goes it has a year when it might flatten out and go down and up and so on uh, but overall we're seeing a, an upward trend and the black diamonds uh, is a five-year rolling average that averages out the peaks and valleys but you can see from that you know the general overall upward uh, increase of the scores over the last 10 years and then the line on the bottom is the the national average and the same thing for the math, uh, that uh, the white diamonds are capable of the high school, the black diamonds the rolling five-year averages. So that just gives us a picture of general growth for the school. Okay, for the uh, class of 93, they were fantastic uh, testers. They really were, and uh, they, they got some great scores on the SAT. Their verbal is 488, and if you look down in the lower left-hand corner, um, you see the one-year change, uh, and that's plus 17 points for this class, their growth from the previous year, which is excellent. And then to the far right, you see the five-year trend, which is plus 33 points, and that's even better. Um, so that's um, excellent growth on the verbal. On the next page is the math, 516. It's the highest math score we've had for a long time in our school probably for 20 years or something. I haven't seen one that, that high for a while. For a one-year change, it's plus 15 points. For a five-year trend, it's plus 36 points, and that's excellent. It really is. The next page, uh, top 10th high school. Our students, this is self-report information, and you know it never comes out quite right, um, but it's close. 12% uh, of the students reported themselves as being in the top 10%, so it's not entirely accurate. However, it's still pretty interesting, as you can say, see here, the top 12% in the class, uh, their verbal is uh, 601. Their five-year trend is plus 29 points. That's, that's very good. Uh, next page, same thing for math, uh, top 10. Uh, 647 and then we see this funny thing on the one-year change um, that they're actually minus four points and I guess that means the top uh, 10 in the class didn't have tremendous score growth where the score growth came was from the students further further down in the ranking because overall there's a five-year trend there of plus 33 points Okay, uh, this is the test of standard written English section. When I said we see a little glitch on the SAT that shows us that maybe uh, grammar, written expression, that our students don't have formal skills in that area because uh, what we see here is the students got a 47.5 on the TSWE, but for one year change, that's a minus 1.0. And um, 
they were great testers with verbal, but it means that with written English, you know, formal knowledge of, of those skills uh, must not have been, been here for that group. Overall, five-year trend is plus 2.0, and I think it's, it's evidence, again, that there needs to be um, skills taught in that area. Then uh, the last pages are so just some demographic information. Um, I'll point out a few things to you, and you probably have noticed some things yourself. Um, the uh, education appearance in the community um, for 93, again, uh, you know, demographics of the community, extremely well-educated uh, <coughs> families. Um, on um, academic record on the next page, uh, we're seeing some, I think, very positive uh, information under uh, SAT verbal scores for growth, the one year and the five year trend. Uh, it's saying that for five scores five to 599 and 600 and above that we're seeing plus percentage growth of plus 2%, plus 5% in one year and seven and 8%. So we're seeing scores grow on the upper end of the scores and decrease on the lower end of the scores in the verbal. Uh, we're seeing something similar in, in math. In 600 and above, we're seeing um, some very good, very positive percentage growth of scores in those upper score levels and actually decreasing of scores on the lower end. Uh, let me see. The um, achievement tests are on the next page, and um, I didn't see anything extraordinary there, and unless you did, if there was an achievement test area that was of interest to you that you saw a uh, problem with any scores. Um, Again, we're seeing growth in, in math, mean score going up uh, 34 points on the achievement test. Um, I, I just didn't see any extraordinary problems there unless, unless you did. Um, let me see, uh, academic, okay, percent of students taking uh, I, I thought this was uh, good information. On academic record, it's on page nine, down at the bottom. We're see I thought it was very positive that we're seeing growth of students taking three or more years of foreign language, and we're encouraging the students to do that, to stay with foreign language, stay with math, with sciences, to, you know, to stay with those courses all the way through high school, and this report is showing us that, indeed, they are doing that over the one-year or five-year trend that students are taking. Uh, four or more years of math and three or more years of language and sciences. So that's, that's very good. And on college plans, nothing uh, extraordinary there. We're, we're uh, seeing uh, some growth in biological sciences, health, allied sciences, communications are areas that are great career opportunities and uh, our students are picking up on it and in career interests in those areas. And um, Another interesting thing I noticed is percent of degree level goal. Um, we're seeing students who are interested in BA, BS degrees, but we're seeing growth in students who, as high school students, are telling us that they're planning on graduate study. Uh, plus 8% in one year, plus 11% over five year trends. So students who are doing some really long range thinking and planning um, and aspirations about their education. Uh, let me see. Okay, that's it. Uh, unless you have some questions, or areas you want to go back and review, uh, certain areas of concern. Any questions? I included an extra report. Um, for the last two years, we've had that article from the Boston Globe: ten of the best uh, ten suburban schools in the Boston area, and what their SAT scores were, and. Um, I called the Massachusetts Department of Education just to try to find out if I could get those scores again. I discovered this office called the Parent Information Center. Um, and in Massachusetts Department of Education, a parent can call and get an educational profile on any public school in Massachusetts, which is terrific. 
So I asked for and got uh, the 10 schools that we looked at for the last two years, and they're included as an addendum report for you. Um, and on the back side of each of their profiles, there's their combined SATs uh, for through 1992. Um, it might be interesting for you to look at any particular community that you're interested in. Our combined total this year is 1,004. And um, we match up with a couple of schools in this pool, and some, some of them are stronger than we are. But uh, you know, we're, we're compatible, I think, with this suburban group here. There's some that, that have uh, some very strong scores. OK, <laughs> moving right along, AP scores. Um, I decided the report that I gave you wasn't very helpful. It was the last one I did, and I, it really doesn't have very much that helps you at all. So I have another one for you. The one that I put in your packet uh, told you how many students were taking AP exams, but didn't tell you what their scores were. So what's in the packet that I've given you here is uh, six years of uh, our students' scores on AP exams. And just some very quick uh, overview information here. Um, uh, in, in general, AP scores of three or higher indicate sufficient mastery for students to qualify for exemption from a college course. So a, a number of uh, students with three or higher or who qualify uh, are indicated on each report. qualify for college credit. So you can look through each year and, and look quickly at how many took AP exams and how many qualified, and then look at specific uh, exams to see fives, fours, threes, twos, and ones. Um, generally speaking, our students are qualifying uh, pretty well. Um, it's 66% for the class of 93. 73% for the year before, 88% for the year before, 91, 90, and 87. Um, so um, two-thirds or better of the students taking tests uh, are getting qualifying scores. Uh, I tried to look through this and see if there would be an area of concern that, that you might want to pick up on. Um, I need to point out to you the um, French scores for the class of 93. Now, I have to explain to you a little bit about that. Um, our top French students didn't take the AP exam in 93 for a variety of reasons. Uh, so they're missing. <laughs> Their scores are missing. Um, one student uh, chose to take uh, Spanish and English, and the, the exams cost $60. And so he just decided he didn't want to do three. Um, another student found out his college wouldn't accept the score for college credit, so he decided he didn't want to waste the $60. And uh, a couple of students uh, couldn't take it um, for other reasons, so our top testers didn't get in the pool last year. Um, but if you look in other years, you'll find out that there's a, a healthy balance on the, on the French scores that, you know, a healthy number of them do qualify with an AP score. Any questions? OK. The last report, and Mrs. Liberty made me promise I would bring this, bring this to you tonight. And it's included in your packet. It's French Achievement with Listening. It's a new exam started by the College Board last year. It will continue onward in all uh, foreign language areas after this year. So three of our students took uh, French with Listening last year. and. Um, what you need to know is that uh, 10,000 students took this exam. The national average score was 508. And our three students who took it last year got a score of 537. So they, um, 
actually did very well on it. Uh, we'll have students doing it this year in both French and Spanish, so this will be a part of our reports in the future. 30% uh, of the exam is, is uh, auditory, listening uh, and tapes and, and having to answer questions about uh, spoken French. I'll stop there. Any questions? Any questions? I, can I just make a comment? You've obviously put a lot of work into this and, and we appreciate it, but it is a lot of material to absorb. And I was wondering if, when we get a big packet of material like this, if we could just get a memo on top, kind of summarizing your basic, you know, what you're seeing for trends, sure. or, you know, what you would like to point out so that when we're reading through it before we get to the board meeting, you know, we have a little bit of a yardstick. Okay, that's great. I'd be glad Thanks. to do that. Yeah. Thank you, Sharon. Okay, the next item is school board subcommittees and reports, and the first is finance subcommittees. Get over the chair, Peter Let's. Thank you. There really isn't a finance uh, subcommittee report again this month. Uh, this uh, is always a slow period. That is not to say, however, that there is not a lot going on, uh, particularly if one were going to ask the, uh, the business manager uh, the experiences that he's having with uh, the transition. Uh, but uh, we are getting a handle on uh, a lot of the budget items. Uh, we're beginning to see where uh, you know, how the year is beginning to look. And we're also spending uh, a lot of time on negotiations, uh, none of which, of course, I can speak about or any of us can speak about in public. Um, we will be getting into the budget, uh, you know, in the next few months. And, uh, you know, then there will be a much more substantive Finance Committee report. Does anybody have any questions about any financial matters? Scott, is there anything you want to bring to the whole board's attention? Although the whole board was at the Finance Committee meeting, this set for Beth, so. <laughs> and you, you could have come if you wanted to. Okay. It was a public meeting. <laughs> it was a public meeting. Uh, no, not okay, then that's it. Thank okay. you. Okay, policy subcommittee is next. Rosemary? Uh, yes, we met um, in part of our monthly policy subcommittee meetings, and quite frankly, the last uh, policy subcommittee meeting really dealt with uh, the building referendum and what if uh, this didn't pass what some of the policy issues might be I really don't want to explore those right now but just be aware that the board has looked at um, some of the situations that we will have to be dealing with in the next budget if uh, we do not have passage of this and I will announce that there is a policy subcommittee meeting at 9 o'clock on November 3rd in the superintendent's conference room. And uh, the other work that we did, which will be the second readings, will be under uh, unfinished business. Okay, the next is building committee. It should probably say slash referendum. And Connie, did you want to make any comments? Well, um, once again, I think it's, extremely important to ask the citizens of this town to pay attention to the referendum. Uh, I have really appreciated the fact that we've done, I think it's four Saturday morning tours with three more to go. And uh, probably 75 people uh, who are not related, directly related to the schools have taken advantage of that opportunity so far. What I find fascinating is the list of questions that people have and the issues that they raise uh, ranging from, you've got to be kidding, it can't possibly cost $11 million to fix the heat and the electricity and a few lights and so forth. Um, I do think, to be perfectly honest about it, if people hang in there for the two hours, and sometimes people can't, and uh, for a variety of reasons, they come and ask a few questions and then leave. We appreciate everybody who has shown up, whether they're in agreement with a referendum or not. We really do appreciate you taking the time. It's a complex issue. It is one that is hard to explain quickly. Uh, we are, um, and I think other members here would like to talk about the um, efforts to publicize in the uh, upcoming supplement. And uh, we are 
really anxious to reach out and give information, open the door, let people ask these questions and have a discussion. I cannot emphasize enough that there isn't any attractive, low-cost alternative. There simply isn't. Now, I recognize that having said as much, people are going to believe that somewhere down the line there's a $5 million solution to this, and we are struggling to put enough data together in a variety of ways, both um, we have a middle school parents association meeting coming up Thursday. We hope that many stu uh, parents or non-parents for that matter in the community will take advantage of that whether or not you have students in the middle school. We'd love to see people who are not normally associated with the schools there also. The meeting is in the cafeteria at the middle school. We think it's important for people to see that space and to be there long enough to realize some of the mustiness and the dank atmosphere and the, frankly, just kind of a general sense of being suffocated when you're down there, um, and realize that this is a significant issue. Somehow, I find in talking to people that they tend to think that because it's a cafeteria, we're talking about 20 minutes with a youngster eating lunch, and why can't they eat lunch in some corridor somewhere? Why do we have to have a cafeteria? I think it's important, again, for the community to understand that when we're talking about building a cafeteria space, it would be a wonderful addition to the community services program. The way this program is outlined, the way the model, um, this concept design is outlined, um, that's a capacity for 600 people, adults as well as students. It does have a small, would have a small stage. It could become an assembly area. We have nothing, nothing, K-8 well, one eight with the kindergarten and the high school that even remotely comes close to a suitable assembly area, and we haven't said a whole lot about that, but uh, we have youngsters who uh, regularly participate in various kinds of dramatic programs and other, uh, uh, in their private life, and we know that we have youngsters who are interested in, uh, would love to be more participative in that kind of thing. We are badly hampered. But the community can use that. There are choral arts societies or the uh, chamber groups or various other groups that this community is involved with. And um, the Spurwing Church is a nice place to go to for a concert, but it would be nice to have some place that is heated in the winter uh, that would lend itself to that kind of um, activity that would, again, be important for the community. There are just all kinds of issues that we need to make sure that people are aware of. I think it would be really counterproductive for the referendum to fail simply because it was complex. I do hear also from people that there's somehow a Cape Elizabeth tradition to take two passes at any issue, that you automatically fail the first time out. Uh, I just simply have to say, why? I mean, we have studied this issue and part of our information is to try to make it clear to people that this has been well studied. I don't think we can study it a whole lot more. In fact, I, I wouldn't recommend that we spend any more money on study. And I think that I would just question, why does it take two referenda if somebody, I, I guess the only reason I could come up with is that people are convinced that somewhere there is a less expensive plan. Um, I would really like an opportunity and I know other members of the our members of the building committee we've all offered our time in a variety of settings I just hope that people will really come forward ask questions come to the meeting we have another board meeting on the 26th we really invite people once again we're going to hold it in the middle school cafeteria we think that's a a uh, an opportunity for people to get a mini tour if they don't want to uh, do the whole thing um, please read the supplement Please call, please ask questions. Please don't not vote just because you don't know the answers. Uh, we really want to give you information. Charles? It's interesting. Um, I was one of two uh, building committee men members who joined Connie last Saturday. And the first hour was spent in the lobby of the middle school answering questions. And it was interesting, by the time we got through the tour the next hour, how some of the people who asked the questions seem much more convinced that something needed to be done. So I ab avail everybody out there in the next three Saturdays to take advantage of these tours. Uh, one of the things we've heard is that people have not gotten enough information and it's come very late, even though we've been studying this for three years. Um, 
one of the ways of finding out some information is to take a first-hand look at it and ask some first-hand questions. Uh, I just did want to comment to some of the people who um, I have spoken to or people like them who may not understand. Uh, the building committee is not made up of the superintendent and the school board. It was made up of two school board members, two town councilors, uh, seven other members of the community who are professionals who have served as volunteers. And the town manager and the superintendent are ex officio members of this. And that as uh, has been stated a few moments ago, this is not something that we threw together in six months. This has been a three to five year study. When I was on the town council, this plan uh, for space study uh, began as a result of, uh, in part, the building of three portable structures. And what a lot of people who have moved in town in the past five years, or people like me whose students are no longer in the elementary or the middle schools, may not understand is our portables permits are up soon, and having sat on the town uh, planning committee uh, meetings, uh, those permits are not necessarily likely to be uh, renewed. So we have some real issues, and that's why I said as policy chair, we have been dealing with what might happen if some of the space that we currently have available to us is no longer usable for our students. And our student population is increasing, not decreasing. So I would ask um, people who are making judgments about, well, the school was uh, good enough for me or good enough for my students, it's good enough for the kids that are there, to please come and uh, take the tour, if not take the tour, at least take a look at this because um, there are a lot of issues um, besides the $11.7 million price tag that go with this. And I would suggest to people who maybe haven't studied the issue as much as they could, it won't be cheaper if we uh, come back a year from now. It won't be the same people coming back a year from now. And some of the solutions may no longer be available because those options have closed. So when people go to vote November 2nd, uh, please be informed um, on the issues and not just the price. Thank you. Peter? Well, uh, you have all said very eloquently a number of very important things. And so as finance uh, chair, I'm just going to add one thing from my perspective of having dealt with this issue for now almost six years. This is my sixth year on the school board and I think in one way or another I have been dealing with uh, building problems uh, ever since I was elected. But looking at it from a banking or a financial point of view, there's no doubt whatsoever in my mind that this first has to be done. And second, there has never been a better time to do it. Interest rates have never been lower so the cost of our borrowing would be reduced and the slackness in the construction industry means that we're going to get, when we go out to bid, the very best price. So this is really truly a time to seize the opportunity and get this behind this community. I have a question for the finance chair. Um, Peter, is it your understanding that this bond issue is going to ask for an authorization of up to $11.7 million? instead of borrowing of 11.7 million. I think that some people are confused that they think that if they vote to approve 11.7 that the entire 11.7 will be spent when in fact I believe the wording is up to. Up to is, is my understanding. I don't have it in front of me but uh, you know certainly uh, when we go out to bid uh, we would take the lowest bid and if that were under 11.7 million dollars uh, you know, that would be, you know, to our benefit. And I uh, uh, am convinced that the bidding for this job, if it's uh, approved, will be very, very competitive. Thank you. Yes. Okay, I just wanted to mention that the Cape Courier would have a four-page um, spread for people to read about, and there will be a direct mail piece going to every home. Um, so that, that information will be coming out. And if you have questions on that, to please call. Okay, I'd just like to point out a couple of uh, things that haven't been mentioned. Uh, there is going to be a call-in TV show on the local cable station from 7 to 8 next Monday, October 18th. 
they'll be held right here. There'll be a variety of people here. Um, Connie will be here, school board, building committee members, the architects. So I hope people will call in and ask their questions if they can't get to one of the tours or one of the other meetings. That's a good opportunity. Also, there's information, all the reports um, from both committees, the School Space Study Committee and the Building Committee, the reports, the complete reports are in the library. They include the minutes, so you can see what the thinking was of both committees. I think that does uh, alleviate some people's anxieties that all the options have not been studied. In fact, when I went back and read them, having been on both committees, I was astonished, really, at how often we talked about looking for the you know most cost effective plan we could I just want to reiterate to people that every single person on these committees is also a taxpayer in Cape Elizabeth um, you know we're not just foisting this on people as some you know Cadillac plan here um, and I think if anybody's been reading the Portland Press Herald lately there are a whole lot of schools out there building uh, right now and this this plan is uh, quite cost effective in comparison to many, so I suggest people read those articles, see what other school systems are getting for their money, and I think you'll agree um, that we're, we're getting a pretty good deal. Okay, the next item is unfinished business, uh, second reading of policies. Who would like to go there? Do you want to? Well, we're, we're presenting for a second reading, um, Chapter 1 Program Parent Involvement, uh, file IKADA, and Student Assessment file IL, and Promotion and Retention of Students, uh, IKE. And we can take them together or separately since none of them are really remarkable. Does anybody have any questions, comments on any of these policies? Okay. Do I hear a motion? I move okay. that we accept I K E, comma I L comma I K A D A as just named um, for a second reading. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Five zero. Okay. The next item is new business personnel requests. I'll turn it over to Connie. Okay. Um, I have to add an item to this section of the, you know, the list because today I just received a letter indicating a resignation that will be effective, well, actually that would be the beginning of the December Christmas break, December 22nd. Wilma Miramontes, who is teaching uh, Spanish for us at the middle school, uh, is letting us know that her husband has gotten a promotion, but unfortunately, that means that they will be moving out of state. Sorry to see Wilma go. She's been with us. This is her third year, right? Um, so I just received this. I didn't have time to let her know. I would take it to the board, but I got to thinking that if we didn't go through this process today, uh, we will obviously have to um, advertise. And I know it's not easy to find a suitable replacement at that grade level and so on, so I thought we would do it. Please give her, let her know. I, I sometimes find people are surprised that we announce things to the community at large when they may be a little surprised. Um, that will just need a, you know, a, a vote of acceptance on your part. The second item under personnel requests, request for the Fulbright Teacher Exchange, I included a letter from Rachel Garrett who is teaching um, science at the seventh grade level. Um, and uh, she is interested in the exchange program that the Fulbright people uh, sponsor. I uh, had a chance to talk to two or three of you in advance of this meeting because she did have to put some papers in, so I gave her tentative approval to go ahead and, and it's basically at this point simply asking or listing her interest in what will actually happen uh, as a result of her application and do not know. Um, I would note for you on the application that we included a copy of that the school board, the administration, does have a uh, right to question or to be assured that the replacement teacher, if this becomes an exchange, we have the right to determine whether that's a satisfactory move for us. So I feel that that's a uh, fail safe uh, should she, in fact, wind up being chosen. 
Is, at that point, is that an administrative decision or is that a board decision? Well, uh, I think like a lot of other issues, the, you would be turning to your administrators to go through any kind of process to determine the suitability of the exchange. Um, I don't think I would be taking that step without informing you in some way. Uh, are you asking me if we would then take the exchange teacher to a board for an appointment as we normally do? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, that's not a, a process that I've been through. I, 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 I'm hesitating because the, if I understand this process correctly, as they've outlined it here, the person remains as an employee and paid by the company, the country from which they come or whatever, private school, whatever it may be. Uh, therefore, we're not paying them directly. And I think the issue is a review of the suitability of that candidate. I doubt very much that it would be subject to Maine statute. It would be a question of your, your being satisfied the process we've used to determine if that's a satisfactory replacement, but you're pleased with the process. The system having had a bad experience I understand. Six, I wasn't here at the time. Three years ago, four years ago. Yeah. That was my question. Who, who finally makes that determination? Other than what's on paper, how do you evaluate someone you have not seen that's going to come here? Are you yeah. asking me a question? <laughs> well, some of us could travel to the country, <laughs> I suppose. Um, <laughs> all kidding aside, uh, I know it's a serious question. I don't mean to be facetious. It's. Um, uh, I haven't done it. I don't know exactly what we would do. I have no question in my mind that should she be accepted into this program, we would have some time to figure out what the story is. Um, I really hesitate to um, to dampen the enthusiasm of a promising young teacher to uh, what would obviously be a, um, a learning experience for her. Uh, I would like to at least get into the process before I made that final judgment of whether or not this is going to wash. I think my questions are not that I don't approve the process and this particular teacher. I'm just because of past history mm -hmm. and we had no say or weren't even made aware other than we approved someone for Fulbright exchange. exchange and that was it. And then we got into a very bad situation with the reciprocal teacher that came here that had to go back. Yeah. So. Well, I think that kind of an experience certainly uh, gives one some questions to ask in advance. I mean, it's, um, it, I have no idea, I have not yet gone through this process. I don't know how sensitive their processes are to everybody's needs, but they do make the point that we can say no if we're not satisfied that we have a suitable candidate. I can look into that, obviously, and find out how many ways in which you can get information and how soon in advance, that kind of thing. Uh, I would uh, guess that uh, this is a, uh, that Rachel certainly doesn't want to put us in a bind, that she doesn't want to leave her students high and dry either. Um, I think it's a manageable situation. I just thought of something. In this age of telecommunications and video, you would think it would be part of the portfolio of application that you supplied a teaching experience. Point. So a that you had too. some way of seeing the teacher in process. Can I just ask, um, so we would continue to pay Rachel's salary mm -hmm. and not pay this other teacher. Now, what if for some reason we didn't like this other teacher? Would we have to go out and hire a long-term sub? Well, you're asking me questions that I don't yet, yet. I mean, this is something that has come up in the last couple of weeks, and I have not researched um, all the ins and outs. I do, obviously, we all, we all know the Fulbright is a reputable group. We're not dealing with, with uh, something that doesn't have a history behind it. Um, I, I can certainly appreciate it was my first thought, and that's why I read the, there is a kind of safety net here. I would want to take full advantage of that safety net and be assured our first or my first obligation, frankly, is to assure the students of a good program. Nevertheless, staff development, opportunities for staff, is an important part of our attitude towards uh, being a learning organization. Um, I see no reason to, at this point, to advise you that I think we shouldn't even allow her to apply.
Rosemary. Uh, I, I have no problem uh, making the, the motion uh, to allow her to apply and continue the process, but I did have a question. Um, I can see where this experience would be extremely beneficial in the classroom for the social studies aspect of her assignment. Mm -hmm. She also is a very proficient science teacher, mm -hmm. and I just want to know if the likelihood of a match of a candidate for that assignment um, might be possible, and if not, do we have a backup plan uh, within our current staff? Will she be all social studies next year? Do you see a change in the uh, population in your students so her, her prorated uh, assignment between science and social studies would change if she stayed, or is it too early to have that discussion? Probably my best answer would be to say it's too early to, to tell you that. I can say that we have had some conversations about what her assignment might be next year, um, but it's really too early to announce anything definite. Okay. Thank you. I would like to make a motion to first accept the resignation request of Wilma Miramontes, effective December 22nd. I'll second. second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Five zero. Charlie. Next, I would um, put forth a motion to accept the request of Rachel Garrett to proceed uh, her application process for a Fulbright teacher exchange. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Five zero. Okay, that's as far as we've gotten. Right. right. Okay. Um, the next thing, um, this doesn't require a vote. I have received by the October first deadline one request to consider a sabbatical uh, for the for next year's academic year. Um, person uh, putting that request in is not absolutely certain that. Uh, that will come forward, but the teacher wanted to make sure that the request was in on time. That then triggers a, and I think, I'm not sure if it's in your packet or not, but you may have seen it before. In the contract, there is language for how we handle the sabbatical, which uh, basically covers a committee composed of the teacher's principal, his or her elementary supervisor department head, the superintendent of schools, a member of the school board. So at this point, all I would like to do is alert you that we did have one request, and I believe from my conversation with the teacher that December will be the month when we will get together and look at that request and look at um, the other aspects of that. So all we need right now is a volunteer from the board who is willing to serve on that committee. Can we say who it is or no? You can't say who it is or does everybody? Um, at this point, I, I did no. not discuss okay. with the teacher, particularly because I, I would not be sure exactly how okay. wide, what the what widespread knowledge of, of the thought about this, so I, I'm a little hesitant. Uh, we're only starting the process. So. Is anybody eager That's to? That's something I haven't done in okay. four years to serve on a sabbatical committee. Okay. Well, here's your chance. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, and okay, we have uh, some staff changes I need to explain to you. I think these are all laid out for you in two yellow pages. You have the first one is staff changes, the other co-curricular and athletic pay positions. Um, due to health considerations, uh, some changes in um, personal circumstances, what we have two of our special education department, uh, one half-time and the other full-time, are really, we're really changing their assignment. So that Lynn Meter, who has been a full-time special education teacher, we're changing her assignment to half-time at the middle school. And Tammy Stanley, who has been working half-time, we're changing her assignment to full-time, and you can affirm that with a vote. Um, and do you have a question? Should we take that separately from the athletic fee? You probably would want okay. to, yes. I do I hear a motion? Okay, I move that uh, we accept uh, the meter's uh, reduction to half time and Tammy Stanley's increase to full time. Second. Rosemary. Any discussion? All in favor? 
Thank you. And the last <coughs> item, um, the co-curricular and athletic fee. We have additional athletic positions. Uh, girls indoor track team, Larry Greer. Indoor track assistant part-time, Bill Rice. A change on um, the seventh and eighth grade soccer B team, David Shields. Uh, and girls JV soccer coach, the second team for the JV, Kim Lewis. Um, the last item I think does deserve a little bit of explanation. Um, the, this is um, a position that was not originally funded through the budget. Um, I became aware that there was a, a, a plan in place actually, or already started, where parents were funding this position. Um, I discussed it with the athletic director, with a coach involved, with a parent who was involved in the situation. We all agreed that the proper thing to do was to bring it to the board and use a right, regular process. Um, the, this team did not have a full season. The coach's uh, stipend is $1,200. I included that in your packet. Uh, and my recommendation is that we simply um, add this at this time, and I will continue to discuss the process with the proper internal people. Any comments or questions? Okay. And, um, well, I might as well finish the list. Additional co-curricular positions. High school newspaper, Tracy Brennan, which is a change. And Gail Parker, I'm nominating her to take Shirley Willis's place as our ADA coordinator. President. I'll move acceptance of the superintendent's recommendations for additional athletic positions for 93-94 school year and the additional co-curricular positions for the same 93-94 school year. Second. As read. Any discussion? I just, as I listen, I, I realize we did put additional here on the sheet. This does not mean they're non-budgeted. The only one that was not part of the regular budgeted process was the um, girls' JV soccer coach. Everything else, all we meant by additional, is that they were situations that we were we had we already have. brought you other lists. I just want to make sure they're not okay. didn't just all of a sudden add a lot of positions. I have to comment on the girls JV soccer coach and it, it's there is a process and I feel that the superintendent is going to deal with the situation that there is a budgetary process and there is a formal application process for 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 hiring staff within the system and when when well-meaning coaches and well-meaning parents circumvent that then I think they're doing both the kids and the community a disservice. There is a process and it needs to be addressed. And I think the superintendent is going to address it. Any other comments? Do I hear a motion? Didn't I we already had it. We're, all right, <laughs> we're up to the voting part. All in favor? Five zero. Thank you. Okay, I would entertain a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discuss discussing negotiations. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Five zero. Military presence in Jericho and especially Gaza is significant. Troops will remain to protect some 4,000 Jewish.